If we haven't had a chance, to, <clears throat> excuse me. There we go. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Pastor Curtis, and I'm glad that y'all are here with us this morning. Welcome to the Salem Methodist Church. Um, we've got a couple of announcements as we get started. Actually, more a few good stories. I won't take too long, but just some really cool stuff I want to share with y'all. Uh, if you look in your bulletins on the very back on the top, you see that we had a baptism today. This last week, we've got a family that's been coming to our uh, dinner church service. We have a, a service on Tuesday evenings, free meals, so there's one night a week, mom doesn't have to cook, activities so that everybody has something to do of all ages together, and then, of course, worship. And this young boy, um, nine years old, he, he wanted to get baptized. And so just this last week, I met with them. I said, okay, man, I, I love it. Let's talk about what that means. And we opened that up together. And I said, okay, uh, when do you want to get baptized? I started looking at grandma. And he goes, I want to do it as soon as possible. Can we do it this Sunday? Go, that's why you got it as an email and not an announcement last week. I was like, yeah, sure. Cool, man. Let's do this. And we talked about the different ways to get baptized. Here in the West, we like to immerse people. And that's what he wanted to do was to be dunked. And I said, and that's, uh, so we started talking about what that means, and, um, and we were able to use the, uh, the hot tub at the parsonage there to do that, so that it wasn't freezing cold. And, uh, and I said, okay, man, so we can do this following second service, invite the whole church to come. He goes, I want to do this as soon as possible. Can we do it at the coffee house service? It's like, yeah, sure, great, let's do it. So we've already had the baptism. Praise the Lord, and I love how on fire this kid is for, for our Savior, Jesus Christ. I also want to invite you to join me in celebrating something great that, that happened in Catherine's life. Um, not Kathy, Catherine. Got to make sure you get that right. That's right. She doesn't like to be called Kathy. But uh, uh, Catherine uh, just finished passing the bar to become a broker here in the state of Florida. So she is now a broker for the state of Florida. Isn't that awesome? So we wanted to celebrate that with you. And then one last thing, uh, another story between Catherine and I and, and, and a few others actually who attend our first service. Uh, I have something here special to share with you. The jar of dirt. There you go, let's go. Um, if you've been with us the last few months, you know that we've been going on this awesome journey of exploring who we are. We've been trying to uh, go through the archives of this 172-year-old church, and we've been digitizing them. And in that, not only do we find that this, we were at two other locations before this, but we actually started to find some information, went down to the courthouse, found the deeds to our church from 1851 and 1909. And because deeds were very vague back then, all we knew was it was next to the cemetery, the Salem Cemetery and Salem Road. Well, Catherine's mother-in-law uh, family lives next door. They were kind enough to let me come over there. And so I started looking around. I did a little bit of digging down with their permission. Um, and I got some soil from there. And then I went to the cemetery, and I, I found the oldest grave, and I got some soil from there. And I went to the very back of the cemetery, dug down a little less of soil from there, went to the far side. We don't know which of the three sides our church was on. But what is guaranteed is the property of our church from 1851 is in this jar. And now we forever have that as part of our church heritage. How cool is that? So it is in recognizing that we worship a Jesus Christ who is beautifully sacred and ancient, thousands of years ago was here among us. Yet he is still alive, active, and well in our lives today. And that's the Jesus we're here to worship today. I want to invite you to join me in an opening word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much that we can both look into the past and know we have a future. Not because of some philosophical ideology, but because, Holy Spirit, you are alive and you move us and guide us. You, you build us up and strengthen us. You give us direction. And so that's why we're here. We want to sit at the feet of Jesus to hear him speak sacred truths into us. And we will be very careful to give you and only you all the glory, honor, and praise now and forever.
And if you have your Bibles, grab them with me. We're going to head over to the book of Acts, fifth book of the New Testament. And let me share something kind of neat with you here if you didn't know this. The book of Acts is actually Luke's second book that he wrote of the Bible. The Gospel of Luke was written by the same guy. As a matter of fact, what's really cool is if you read the first verses of Luke and, and Acts, what you find is that both of them are letters he wrote to his buddy, Theophilus. If you didn't know this, one of the, one of the, the, the inspiring and key things for Luke was he was not one of the 12 apostles of Jesus. He actually set out to do an investigation to figure out if this Jesus guy he had heard about was just a whole bunch of hoopla or if there was something very real about it. The reason it's in the Bible is because he actually interviewed Mary and the apostles and the people that were there and got firsthand accounts. So y'all, this is from an investigator who at the very end of this wrote this letter to his buddy Theophilus of what he figured out and found out about Jesus. And so listen to this from a guy who talked to the people who saw this happen and he still lived in the same time as Christ did. From Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, listen to this from the Word of God. In my first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he suffered, he presented himself to, to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the time or date the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, whom has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Y'all, this is the word of God for you, people of God. Thank you. We're going to continue our worshiping now through our, our gifts of tithes, offerings, and prayer requests. I want to remind you that if you're a visitor here, do not feel pressured or pushed to give financially. That's a covenant that those who are members have made. We are just honored to have y'all with us. Um, but at the same time, please know there are some blue cards in the pews. You're welcome to fill those out there for prayer requests. Or if you're a visitor, we'd love to get to know you better. Uh, get some of your information there. Anything marked private will be prayed over by me alone. Everything else will also be prayed over by the rest of the church on our prayer list. Y'all, let's continue worshiping together.
you all in response for everything that God has done in your life, is doing and will do. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing the doxology.
children of Levi on her would like to and start making their way forward and invite y'all to join me in singing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, I know. That's actually sign language. I know some sign language. You know some sign language? You, you taught me it. Yes, I did. Actually, I have a friend who, who speaks sign uh, for others, and I like to tell him that he finally knows someone that speaks the sign language with a lisp. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. Okay, CJ, you got the box for us. There's something in the box. He's going to make us guess what it is. And then I have to figure out something on the spot of what that has to do with the love of Jesus. So go ahead. What's your clue? Okay. There's two things, but it's from the same show. Okay. Two things, but from the same show. Okay. And there's three movies and a couple of little ones. Can you give us a clue of what the show is? Guardians of the Galaxy. That's a really good clue. <laughs> we gotta guess who's in there. I'm not sure. Groot if... and the raccoon guy. Is it? Oh, Groot and the raccoon guy. Awesome. All right. So go ahead and just hold them up. Stand up. Show everybody Groot. Groot's shedding apparently. No, nice. Okay. So let me let me see them. Let me see them. Just just the guys. Just the guys. Okay. So if you haven't seen this, these movies yet, these are Marvel movies, and there's one guy that is a tree, and his name is Groot, and his entire language is this, I am Groot, I am Groot. That's his entire language. But his buddy, which just happens to look like an earth raccoon, okay? I'm a mutant. Okay, he's kind of a mutant. He understands everything that he says. All right. So if you ever seen any of those movies or shows, he'll say, I am Groot, and then he'll make some kind of comment about what he said, and that's how you know what's actually going on in the movie. And his hand fell off. Hold on. There we go. Much better. I hate it when that happens. Okay. But you know what? There's something kind of interesting here, all right? <clears throat> Did you know that we can actually hear somebody speaking that nobody else outside of Christianity can hear? Kind of like group here. We actually hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Now, how many of you feel like you've ever heard God speak to you? Eh, a little bit? Yeah, that, that's okay. We don't all have to know that right offhand. Watch this. Watch the adults here. Be honest with me, y'all. How many of you have ever felt like you heard the voice of God or you're not sure if you did? Yeah, about a third of us. All right? I am going to tell you right now how you can know for sure you've actually heard the voice of God in your life. Okay? And I'm going to tell you one of the Christian secrets and tricks so that you can know. And I'm going to prove to you you've already heard the voice of God in your life. Are you ready for this? The world's word for God is talking to you is conscience. You know what a conscience is? The conscience is what makes us feel bad when we do bad things. And we want to go say, I'm sorry. Our conscience is the part of us that when somebody needs to be taken care of or something good needs to happen, even if it's scary and uncomfortable, we want to still do it. You see, we've said this before, friends, in this space, that for evolutionary theorists, there are many things that don't make sense. And the human conscience is one of them. Why would we want to put ourselves at risk and sacrifice for a complete stranger, for their benefit. Evolutionarily speaking, that doesn't make sense. Okay? So, when we talk about what it means to hear the voice of God in our lives, we Christians are really good at overthinking things and talking ourselves out of it. All right? 
Here's how you can know if God's talking to you. If you want to do something to help somebody, and the Bible says it's good, the Bible actually says that's how God is talking to you. For some people, it's, I feel like I really should help somebody. Or I feel like I really should say I'm sorry. Or I feel like I really want to go to church and just spend time with people that I love and that love me. That pushing, that nudging, the big grown-up word for that is the Holy Spirit. That's God trying to talk to you. If you've ever felt like you wanted to help somebody, or you felt bad for doing something wrong, according to the Bible, you've heard the voice of God. Okay? Hi. I'm going to invite you guys to pray with me. And if you'd like, you're welcome to say this after me. Dear God, Thank you for sending Jesus. And thank you for talking to me. It may not be in regular words, but you help me. And I will try to listen. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Okay. So this is yours. And forgive me, are we going to be back next week or just not sure? Yeah? Do you want to, you guys want to take the box? Go for it, honey. Now I've got three rules. You ready? Rule number one, whatever is in there can't be alive. Okay? Rule number two, it can't be something that can hurt anybody. So, so no pocket knives or fishing lures or, you know, small explosives. And rule number three, if you take the box this week, we ask you to try to make sure to come back next week. Deal? Yeah, I remember nothing that was alive. Nothing that was recently alive. That's the other part. Yes, that's right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So for our young people that would like to, uh, Miss Rachel is right outside the door. Um, she's uh, She can take you all to Children's Church. Parents, please always be assured all of our staff are background checked, trained, and certified to take care of our young people.
your Bibles, grab them with me. We're going to head uh, actually over to the Gospel of Luke and read the exact same story from the first letter he sent to his friend Theopolis. Uh, have you ever told a story and like, no matter how much you try, you can't get all the details in, into the telling of the story? That's why it's kind of neat. We actually have two different accounts of the ascension story, when Jesus ascended back to heaven. As a matter of fact, today is what's known as Ascension Sunday, or in other Christian traditions, they call it the Feast of the Great Ascension, or the Feast of Ascension. Um, this is the day that we remember, where when Jesus had risen from the dead, defeating death, that he spent 40 days with his disciples and a bunch of other people. He was seen by over 100 people. And, and at the very end, one day he's talking to his disciples and he takes them up to a small town right on the far side of the hill um, of the Mount of Olives, a tiny little town called Bethany. And it is there that he blesses them and he ascends back up to heaven. All right? Now, one of my favorite things that I just absolutely love about Ascension Sunday, and this isn't even in the sermon, but I'm going to say it anyways, all right? Is I love the fact that Jesus physically went back to heaven. He didn't just sit there and just, the body fell over dead, and, and it, you know they saw his spirit go up there. That they're very detailed, very specific, that the flesh, the body, went to heaven. And, and there's two reasons this is important. Number one, because... Um, if Jesus would have just fallen over dead and his spirit went up to heaven, then people could have just said, oh, y'all made up the last 40 days. He was always dead. He never rose from the dead. But secondly, and more important, at least for me personally, is the fact that Jesus Christ, when he went to heaven, he did something that never had been done before. When we talk about being saved, accepting Christ in our heart, y'all, we, we say not only do we have peace with God now, a relationship with Him now, someday we get to go there. And we are told we are going to get a new body, which I, j I jokingly like to say I'm really looking forward to it, because then I can play where's Mr. Duncan with both hands. All right? But up until Jesus, that was all theoretical. That was hopeful. We were just going off of a promise. When Jesus took a piece of humanity with Him to heaven... It was no longer theoretical. It was applicable. You see, Jesus Christ became our trailblazer. He became our, our path guide. He became our, our, our guide in the wilderness, if you will. He's already taken some humanity to heaven. And so not only do we hope in the fact that one day we get to go to heaven, y'all, it's already been done. So we know, we know where we're going. Y'all, if you got your Bibles, once again, Luke. Chapter 24, verses 44 to 53. Listen to this second account of the ascension story from Luke to his friend Theophilus. And see if you can catch some of the differences in detail that he includes here. He's talking about what Jesus said at this point. He said to them, to his disciples, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you with my father what my father has promised. But stay in the city that is staying in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power from on high. Till you receive the Holy Spirit. When he had led them out, of the, out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them. And was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple. Praising God. Y'all once again. This is the word of God for you. The people of God. Thanks be to God. 
So I started digging into Ascension Sunday, because this is one of those old church festivals that some of us may or may not have heard of, but there really isn't a lot of big, how do you celebrate this, you know? So I kind of want to know, how have people celebrated this over the generations? Um, and what I found is interesting, because that in some cultures, there are some parts of the world, specifically in Latin American cultures, where entire cities will shut down on this day. And there will be a march from one end of the city to another. And everybody from priests to children to politicians to police to business owners, everyone together as a single community will walk this. And they do it almost as a symbol of pilgrimage of the walk we just talked about where Jesus took the disciples from Jerusalem out through the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, and onto the other side to the city of Bethany. In other cultures, churches today, especially churches that are what's called high liturgy, okay, the Catholic Church is high liturgy, um, they'll have a special procession where they'll process in like the cross and the Bible and they'll have incense burning. And that itself is a symbol of this journey. One of the things I, I, I've always kind of wanted to do, I thought it would be fun, I haven't done it yet. Um, and y'all don't remember this because I may do this in the future. I always thought it would be so cool to get some balloons or some lanterns or something and write praises to God, ways that we see the Holy Spirit work, good things we see in Duana, and then in the same way that Christ ascended, let them go. I thought that would be a really fun way someday to celebrate Ascension Sunday. But you see, throughout the generations, this, call, this, this day has been something that I've actually heard other preachers say, I, I don't like it. Because what do you preach on? You know, you've you got the story, which is great, but Jesus kind of just recaps his whole ministry right here, and then he leaves. And it's good, and it's helpful, and it's a wonderful story. Where's the challenge in it, though? Like, like beyond telling the story, what do you teach inside of that? And, and, and what's interesting to me is as I dove into this, I found a few other elements where people kind of felt the same way. And maybe that's why this day isn't as prominent to others. But what I did find is some pretty neat stuff. Can you go to the next slide for me, please? There is a chapel in Israel, in the small city of Bethany, called Ascension Chapel. And the, the chapel is here at this specific location because of this stone. Now, because you're so far back, it might not be easy to see, but you can actually see what looks to be the outline of a footprint there. Okay. Go on the next slide for me. Here's a blown up. You see that with the heel at the bottom. You almost see some toes at top. Um, a pilgrim was walking through Jerusalem, uh, Israel, one time, and he saw this at the city of Bethany and thought, maybe this is the very last footprint of Jesus as he was taken up into heaven. And so this chapel was built over top of this footprint. Now the reality is, is this the last footprint of Jesus Christ on earth? I don't know. <laughs> is it possible? Sure, God can do anything. Is it possible that he led that person to that space because of that footprint? Yeah, that's always a possibility. God can do amazing things. Is it guaranteed that's the footprint of Jesus? No. But the other side of it, we can't lose sight of the fact that the footprint itself is not the point. As a matter of fact, there are a ton of sites like this. If you didn't know this, in the vicinity, there's like five other chapels and churches of the Ascension. All claiming this is where Jesus ascended. Okay, Two of them are, um, are monasteries of different backgrounds and faiths and whatnot. And what's really interesting is even this one here. This one is not just a Christian, uh, Christian chapel. But this is one of the few, and if not the only one, at least I know of, in the world that is both a Muslim mosque and a Christian chapel. And the reason why it's actually owned by the Muslims is because um, the Muslims will actually believe Jesus ascended to heaven. Okay? They believe that Jesus was taken up back into heaven. They believe they don't believe he was the Son of God. They don't believe that he was our Messiah. They, they think we made that part up, even though there's overwhelming historical evidence for it. Um... As a matter of fact, in the Quran, in chapter 4, it talks about this. And it says that they believe that Jesus Christ was perhaps the greatest prophet of all time. That he did do miracles. 
But they believe, according to the Quran, chapter 4, that at one point near the end, God made another man look just like Jesus. And that man was the man crucified on the cross. And that while he was being crucified, Jesus ascended back up to heaven, that, that God was protecting his problems. The problem with this is it means God's a liar. God created a lie by making this masked man. Not only that, but he kills this innocent guy. If God's a liar, then he's not perfect. If he's not perfect, he's a sinner. If he's a sinner, by his own definition, he can no longer be God. No, y'all, my Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose again, and ascended to heaven. And it's for this reason there's great contention over that little footprint right there. But I think what we can lose sight of so often is, honestly, the footprint isn't the point. I know too many people that just get focused just on that. For our Catholic friends, you may have heard of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That that's weird. There's a hole in the ground. They believe the cross once stood. If you don't know, the story behind that is the Emperor Constantine's mother discovered that. She went over there hundreds of years after Jesus, was walking around, felt like she was led to go find the holy places mentioned in the Bible, found this hole in the ground, and said that must be the spot where the cross was. That's where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is today. Does that mean it's not where the cross was? No. God can do anything. But at the same time, there's so much debate over that little hole in the ground that people spend so much time focusing on what was that they don't move past it. Y'all, well, it may be awesome, it may be cool, just to even stand in the place that Jesus was. To look at the last footprints of Jesus may be neat, but it's not the point. It's the next step we take after that. You see, Jesus Christ did not ascend back to heaven just so we can sit there and stare at the ground and go, whoa, that's pretty cool. I mean, he, he, he set us free. He, he empowered us. He gave us authority. As a matter of fact, he told his disciples before he went, you've seen me do amazing things. Imagine being the disciple. You, you watched a guy who had never walked day in his life, 40 years old, and, and you saw Jesus pull him up and you saw a man take his first steps. You saw someone who was blind and everybody around him and the whole city said, yeah, he's been begging for years. And God, Jesus wipes the mud in his eyes and then that guy describes your face to you. Jesus said, you've seen all this stuff. You've seen me teach and, and preach and you've seen me have authority. And then he says, you will do even greater things than I. That's kind of a big deal. You can go on the next slide if you will, please. You know, one of the things we talk about in the church a lot is how much God has blessed us. Is there no slide after that? Oh. Okay, go back to the sermon slide, then, please. Too bad. There you go. You're awesome. Um... We talk so much about how God has blessed us, and we should. I mean, how he's helped us and guided us and given us peace and direction. Have you ever had one of those times where you go, man, I don't know how I made it through that situation. Rather, it was sanity or I should have died. Okay? And yet somehow I was protected. I, I, I was cared for. I had wisdom not to go somewhere I shouldn't go. Y'all, you're describing how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Okay? And we talk all the time about how God blesses us. But the reality is that Jesus also calls us to bless God. And we can feel a little prideful, egotistical, doing that, saying that kind of thing. Oh, I am going to bless God. Because it's like, first of all, you know, he, he's, the, he's like all powerful, all amazing. He, he's the creator of the universe. How could I even come close to blessing God? Have you ever done something nice for somebody and then you sat there and watched their face when they opened the gift or went on the vacation or whatever and just the sheer joy and excitement in their face? You're like, man, I think I got more out of this than you did. That's how you bless God. Have you ever sat down with somebody and, and, and they just asked your advice about something or, or you, you, did some, um, you spent some time with them even if it was something as simple as playing a game, and afterwards you were like, man, that meant so much to me, though they made the sacrifice. For God, that's what it's like for you to bless Him. 
You see, the reality is we can stand there in the last footsteps of Jesus just like the apostles all day long. But the point is the next step we take after that. And the one after that and the one after that. Because it is great and amazing to stand there and go, wow, look at what Jesus just did. But if the apostles would have put their feet in the ground and not moved, we would not be here today. You would not have experienced peace that you have, forgiveness, strength, direction. You know, these are all ways that, that the Bible describes who the Holy Spirit is. We've been talking here at Salem for the last few weeks about how do you even understand or get close to or, or you know, tune into the Holy Spirit. We talked about some ways that we need to recognize there's some things we've got to cut out of our lives. Because, honestly, they're just they're walls between us and God. That, that we need to purposely fill those spaces with something else. Because if you take something out of your life and you don't fill that space, Satan will be happy to do it for you. He'll mess with you. We talked about the fact that Jesus said, here's how you get close to the Holy Spirit. Obey my commands and teachings. It's not some high spiritual experience thing. No, if you want to have that peace, that strength, if you want the, the, the conscience of God to grow stronger and louder and more purified in your life, you do what the word says. Now remember, the point of the commands and the laws and the teachings of Jesus Christ is not to control our lives. He did not set us free from sin just to re-enslave us to paranoia. All right? These are things that actually help us, give us peace and direction, help give us some clarity in what we're doing in our lives. And so if you honestly want to hear God's voice louder in your life, do what he says. And by the way, there's no way to do what he says unless you know what he says. you got to spend some time in the Word. you got to wrestle with it. And then we, we, we move into this space here where, where we've talked about what it means to, to carve off the old. You know, sometimes some people say, I, 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 haven't, I haven't really felt like I've been in the presence of God for a long time. And once in a while, as I'm talking to them, I find that there's a one thing in their life they will not let go of. It's, it's, it's a sin, it's an addiction, it's, it's an anger, it's a forgiveness that they're not offering, whatever that is, is. And God's not trying to nitpick at you. But what he is doing is he's saying, look, you are choosing not to be free and expecting me to still fully be there in your life. It's like cheating on your spouse one day a week and going, I don't know why you don't love me the other six days of the week, honey. You know? But at the same time, you know, if, if we want to be close to God, if we truly want to kind of dive into the Spirit of God, to feel His presence, His wisdom, His peace. I, I love that last week our scripture, Jesus described the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. This week He says, you will be clothed in power from on high. That's him describing the Holy Spirit to us. That we want more of that and we want to, what we need to do is in an essence, we need to bless God. We need to go about doing good works, not for what we get out of it, but because, you know, I just want to make my Jesus smile. I want to, I want to experience him go, ah, yes, do it, that's awesome. I mean, according to scripture, if one person is saved, they're singing and dancing in heaven, when we just had that baptism out there, I would have loved to be standing in the party in heaven. Either it happened or Jesus is a liar. I choose to understand the former, not the latter. So you see, the point is that, that, that the footprint is awesome, and it's fun, and it's interesting, and, and it's helpful. And, and for some of us, just standing there may help us to feel closer to God. But the footprint isn't the point. Standing in the shoes of Jesus isn't the point. The point is what we do after that, the next step we take, and the one after that, and the one after that. I love this because in the last part of our scripture, Jesus says, okay, it says that after he explains all this to them, all right, which by the way was one of the last times he ever showed up to them. He just like appeared as they were talking. If you know the story, when, when uh, the road to Emmaus, when the two men came back and were like, we just hung out with Jesus. And then everyone else goes, yeah, seriously. I, I had, I, you know, I saw Peter jump out of the boat and go swimming to him. And he saw him after he had raised from the dead. Yeah, well, I saw him here. Yeah, well, Thomas experienced this with him. 
The Bible says, as they were talking about this, Jesus appeared to them. And that's where our scripture meets us at. Okay? And it says, after he explains and unpacks all this to them, it says that they went out to the vicinity of Bethany, in verse 15, he raised his hands and blessed them. And I love this. You know, sometimes the most powerful memory we have of somebody is the last time we saw them before they passed. It doesn't say he blessed them and stepped back and went, okay, give me up, Scotty. Okay. It says, while he was blessing them, he was taken up into heaven. It's almost like this beautiful, divine, holy blessing that just spreads across the whole earth. We get the impression from both of Luke's accounts that Jesus didn't put his arms down. It says, while he was blessed. And Luke is very specific. He's a detailed guy. Okay? That he rose his hands. And he said, go out to the world. Yo, go do good things. Do even greater things than I am. How could I do that? You're Jesus. Come on, seriously. It's not because of what you do. It's because of what the Holy Spirit does in you. Don't be egotistical about it. Don't be prideful. Go out there and try and bless Jesus. It's not about staying in the footprints of Jesus alone. It's about the steps we take after that as well. You all pray with me? Heavenly Father God, honestly, I'm floored. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I don't even know how to feel or what to think at the fact that not only do you want to use me, but that you are calling me to do good works for you and other people's lives. To, to be about your ministry, to, to, to watch you heal lives and forgive people and set people free from hate and addiction and, and manipulation. And I, I'm just, I'm amazed. I, I, there's a part of me, God, that struggles to even believe it. But I believe in you more than I doubt myself. And so, Lord, in my frailty, I just want to bless you. And in the same way, I pray the same strength over my brothers and sisters here, as we will give you all the glory, honor, and praise now and forever. Amen. Please stand and join the Peter
this thing's pretty cool, isn't it? But honestly, if we don't keep up the work of God, if we don't keep serving, be in a place where other people know they are loved and accepted, that they won't be judged and pushed away. If we don't keep trying to push ourselves to be uncomfortable and serving Jesus Christ, this is nothing but a jar of dirt. It's not enough to only sit here and talk about what used to be. We have to move forward in the kingdom's work or the people around us, even us, we don't stand a chance in this world. But with Jesus, not only can we survive, but we can thrive. And amazing things can happen. So I challenge you to accept, cherish, and glorify what has been. And then seek to see what it does to take the next step. Here's my challenge for you. In the next 24 hours, I'm going to challenge you to join me in doing one thing with the heart of doing it just to bless God. Receive that as your mission and your blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.